It's been two years this week since Aaron and I started Sourcing Challenge, and with that, this show. We've had to take some time off last year, or for the last year, actually. Uh, but with the support of Amazing Hiring, we're back, uh, and we're starting um, to record some new shows for 2020. So if you like the Sourcing Challenge and the show, please um, consider supporting us by uh, going to Amazing Hiring and using our link in the description below, using the code Sourcing Challenge when you sign up for, uh, for a trial of Amazing Hiring. In this episode, I'm talking to Glenn Cathy, who from the US, who for many is, has been the inspiration for how they learned about sourcing uh, with his blog, Wooling Black Belt, uh, which he's been writing on for the last, I think, 10, 15 years, uh, has been the inspiration for many to learn about this industry and, and where they go first to learn about sourcing. So this interview was recorded last year, uh, but we agreed that um, anything that Glenn says is pretty much uh, timeless um so we wanted to publish it anyway so welcome to episode 42 of the sourcing challenge show as always i started off by asking glenn how he got started in sourcing i have actually come to enjoy telling the story i don't think i've actually told it during a conference so you know when i stumbled like most people did into recruiting i didn't know sourcing was a thing <laughs> um it was a small privately held staffing company in northern virginia I didn't know what it was. I found the job online uh, in December of 96. So there was the Washington Post, the newspaper for Washington, DC. Um, I mean, 96 is pretty progressive to have online ads at the time, right? So I was searching online for jobs and I found something in the other category and it was recruiting. And I went down on the interview and I can make a long story short. Um, you know, the interview seemed interesting. I didn't really totally understand what I'd be doing, but I liked the fact that I could be because it was an, a staffing agency that if I if I did better, I could make more money. I'm like, mm. well, that's all of my jobs after college for me were, you know, hourly and I really couldn't impact my income. So I said, OK, ready for a change. Uh, I start. There was basically no training. We had a, we had computers. And again, I started in January of 97. This database we had was called CPASS, which Lotus Notes based system. <laughs> um, and, you know, it accepted Boolean logic and I didn't. I mean, I remember learning about Boolean logic and like psychology and philosophy, right? And you do that in, in, in uh, school now. Um, one girl taught me, you know, basically ands and ors. And I was like, okay, and she said, this is how you find candidates. So the reason why I like this story is we're all products of our environment for the most part. Yeah. Um, you know, most agencies at the time probably taught a lot of cold calling. I wasn't. Uh, they didn't teach us how to cold call at all. So no like calling into, you know, the IT department of company X and trying to find your way. Other people are experts in that area. That, that's not me. Um, and it took me probably the better part of three months before I got relatively good at finding candidates and engaging candidates and getting placements and, you know, the rest is history. So to be honest, the way I learned was uh, trial and error. Uh, not wanting to be fired, which sounds kind of funny, but that's the reality. Because if I couldn't find and engage candidates and, and get submissions and interviews and hires, I, w I wouldn't have a job. No. So I did a whole bunch of stuff that didn't work. Um, and I spent a lot of hours. I put in a lot of late nights and weekends building what I would call call plans. You know, mm -hmm. I'm working these two jobs. I'm going to find 80 people per job, you know. And when I'd sit down and spend a lot of time, you know, digging into the database, you know, my whole first year, we didn't have any online resource. I didn't even think to go, well, 97, it's kind of around the same time that uh, Google came out, the end of 97, right? You had other search engines, but I didn't even think to do that. Because again, I was hired, they said, this is how you find candidates. And we had about 80,000 total resumes in our database that were primarily comprised of paper resumes that had been scanned with OCR, <laughs> right? Um, we would go to tech fairs and get resumes and just scan reams and reams of resumes. So it was around 80,000 documents. But it's amazing how much you can do even with what some people consider to be a relatively small database. Mm. And my experience was everything in that regard. Like I didn't even have to go outside of the database. And I didn't even know that was called sourcing, right? <laughs> so other people at that time, you know, some other names in the industry, which I didn't, I wasn't even aware of, you know, they're talking about using the internet and here I am just really mining the crap out of my internal database and getting referrals from those people, right? Yeah. So it wasn't just finding those people. But the super short version of the answer to your question is a lot of trial and error. 
and you know doing stuff that didn't work and constantly saying okay that didn't work what can i do next because i actually want to give a lot of credit to my environment that i was paired up as a recruiter with an account manager so mm -hmm. people who haven't worked in in staffing that's common uh, especially in tech staffing environments and you know she would say well i have this job from company x and she's like, you know, I need candidates. And generally, we try to get candidates within, you know, a day or two, really tough jobs. It might take even longer than that. And, you know, you would touch base with your account manager multiple times a day. And they, of course, you know, they made promises to their client that we're going to have, you know, a couple of candidates for you to review soon. And there's that pressure and accountability to say, you know, we can't just go days where we're just like, we have nothing. Um, and I felt that pressure in a very positive way. I wanted to exceed expectations. I wanted to submit really good people, uh, not just the first people I found. And that made me keep going back and asking more questions of our database. You know, how do I find a better candidate? Because if I showed her someone, she's like, yeah, this person doesn't have enough. And the client said, we really want this. I'd say, okay, how do I go back and take that feedback and convert that into a search where I can find people who are more likely to have, you know, what the client or the hiring manager is looking for. And just doing that you know, wash, rinse, repeat over and over and over and over at very high volume yeah. um, with high degrees of accountability is how I learned what I learned. And a lot of what I did, I know I'm rambling here a minute, but I'll tie it all up. <laughs> a lot of what I learned then, even in 97 and 98, which is really funny when I went to the second SourceCon, the first one I ever went to, again, everybody was talking about internet sourcing. And I like to paint this picture because there's a lot of people that join the industry later than that, right? So they can't even relate to what I'm saying. I'm sitting here thinking, why are all these people so obsessed with the internet and resumes on the internet? And it may seem strange because I haven't really shared that too many times with people. I'm like, I'm sitting here killing it with an internal database and I've got all kinds of search techniques that I use specifically inside my database. And I'm like, well, maybe some of those things actually would translate over to web searches anyway, because it's just search, you know, they're searching for stuff, whether it's a resume or a profile or a list or something. And of course it did. A lot of what I felt felt like I figured out through trial and error were, were universal information retrieval best practices. Doesn't matter if you're searching a database or using an internet search engine. Um, so that's where I got it all from. It actually goes all the way back to 97 and 98. And it's just something that's continued to stick with me. I, I, just to wrap up the answer. So I really have an unfair advantage, I think, over many people in that within a year and a half, I got promoted into a leadership role. So I basically had to train and hire and train people to do what I could do. And then I, I was forced to do what I did and never explain anybody. I had to start explaining, okay, this is, this is how you do this and this is why. And when you see this, uh, notice that in the resume, modify your search, do this. And when you start doing that, it really accelerates your own understanding and learning in the space. So it's one thing to do it on your own and execute, but when you have to start at volume, regularly training other people, explaining not just the what, but also the how, mm -hmm. uh, reinforces your learning. And so I have, you know, close to 20 years of experience training other people, which has helped significantly because it makes you think about things in a different way. It's not just what just comes naturally to you. You have to think about how to communicate it to someone who has no idea what you're talking about. You have to start breaking it down step by step how to think about it, not just what search to run, but how did I do that? How do I create people who can do what I did uh, without having to come to me for search strings? Because I've had lots of people come and say, I want this, so, you know, I can give you that, but I need straight. to explain, yeah, I gotta explain, here's how I did this. So when you get a job tomorrow and I can't help you, you're gonna have to learn how to do this on your own. Breaking that down tens of thousands of times for people uh, really helps me get better. When did you start writing? Yeah, so that was actually, um, I think it was the end of 2008 because uh, and I was working for K-Force at the time and I, I do not remember how I stumbled across this weird little uh, square icon for SourceCon. And it came up and I was like, okay, they're talking about finding candidates. Um, I think I, I'm pretty good at it, at least internally, because I've never gone outside of my own company, right? I just know lots of people come to me for um, searches and training on searches and calling and emailing people. So I'm thinking, at least in my company, I'm pretty good, but you don't know until you get outside your company and compare yourself to others. And I remember going to my boss at the time and realizing that I missed the opportunity to go to the first one. I like found it too late. I wasn't even looking yeah. for it. I don't know how I stumbled across it. 
And then um, I was like, well, I mean, I just, maybe there's going to be another one. And when um, a little while later, uh, SourceCon 2 came out in Atlanta, I asked my boss, can I go? He's like, sure. So I went. And uh, I think my story is kind of funny because I, you know, I went there and I saw people like Jim Stroud, who I'd seen online, you know, Amy Beth, who I'd seen online, Shally, who I'd seen online, a bunch of other people. And uh, I was a lurker. I didn't engage anybody. I'm an introvert and I just don't go up and strike conversations with strangers. Plus, the people that you see online, I know that they probably get annoyed by everybody approaching them, so I'd rather stay back. Um, but that's the first time I went to SourceCon, and I, literally everyone is talking about the internet search, internet search, internet search. I'm like, okay, I, I, I get that that's interesting, but I have never had to do that myself. I'm making tons of placements. I'm teaching other people how to make tons of hires uh, without using the internet, but obviously there's something to it. But I'll tell you what, the thing that struck me was I got a sense that some people were making money from like selling training. And this is, this is the true story. It, some part of me was bothered by that because <laughs> I felt that some of the things that people are talking about were relatively basic. Now I know that relatively basic to one person is advanced to another. I get that. But the reason why I started writing is because of SourceCon. I went, I saw these people talk and I said, I know some stuff that I can share with people that no one's gonna have to pay for. And I'm not trying to say that I was some, you know, cr crusader uh, for good, but that is the that is the honest truth about why I started writing. I'm like, I, I gotta start writing about this. I know a whole bunch of stuff and I'm gonna put it out there and I'm gonna help people. Yeah, and now, now, now you have the thing where it's like, people charge and train things that they think is new and then somebody like you comes in, you're like, yeah, here's my article from 10 years ago where I talked about exactly yeah. the same thing. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's funny. Here's another story I've only told in certain circles. <laughs> I won't name names, right? Um, but within three months of me starting to blog, uh, that was the end of October. Uh, that was, I'm sorry, yeah. I think my first post was October 2008. So I started writing in the end of 2008 after the second source come. I actually got a weird phone call at my house. So I mean, somebody had some sourcing skills even back then. Um, <laughs> had no idea how they got my number. And I will not say who this person was. They also referenced another person and said, hey, you know, we really like what you're doing, but some people, you know, this is their livelihood. <laughs> and you're giving it away for free. This is a true story. Um, obviously, I'm not going to mention who these people were. I was just like, is this really happening? I remember saying that call like, is this That's really happening? Like you're telling sourcing, me- Sourcing yeah. mafia. That's 2008, read. <laughs> like 11 years, 11 years ago. Uh, and I was like, hey, that's that's great. I appreciate you reaching out, but it's not going to stop me from, from writing. And I have no problem with people making money um, yeah. from training. I mean, it's all good or writing books or things like that. I think the world in, in the sourcing and recruiting community is a much better place because there's a lot more freely shared information. There's also kinds of uh, fee and paid things like you can buy books and you can buy training programs through SourceCon and social talent. There's a lot of good programs out there. There's a lot, there's enough room for everybody. Yeah. You know, but I don't think anybody should be saying, uh, trying to discourage people from sharing things freely. I think we're beyond that now, but I will say in the earlier days of sourcing, there was kind of a control element of who were the main people that were putting stuff out there. It was absolutely bizarre. <laughs> like you, I know you've been to a lot of conferences, both in Europe and, and in America, obviously with SourceCon, yeah. um, but even on the early days with conferences in Europe, where have you kind of seen the, the biggest difference in the development of sourcing on the European part and, and the American part? Or even like, I know you've been in Asia as well. Has there been a big difference or has it kind of followed each other? No, you know what I find interesting, and maybe it's probably not the case anymore, but I would say earlier, there was always this perception, at least like, for example, like Australasia, that the US is leading the charge, right? Mm -hmm. To some extent, I think for years, there was also the same feeling in Europe. Um, I think what I've experienced in getting around and then building a network is that there are brilliant people everywhere. I think there are more people in the US years ago that were uh, writing and sharing and speaking more. Um, there's a number of people, again, I won't name their names to embarrass them, but there's a lot of really sharp people throughout Europe um, that just don't do a lot of self-promotion, mm -hmm. uh, don't get out there, yeah. don't publish anything at volume. I mean, some do, but a lot don't. 
I think some people were just like me a long time ago where they're just in their company. They're really brilliant. They know a lot of good stuff, but they're just doing their job. And not everybody has the time. Uh, not everybody has to, but not everybody has the time to get out there and publish or create a video or speak at a conference. So I just think that the U.S. historically has had more people that are a little bit more vocal and out there in terms of writing, but that's created a perception that's not been reality. Um, there's a lot of really sharp people uh, throughout Europe. And I think I mean, I'm seeing a, a number of things like uh, growth hacking, that type of uh, approach. A lot of that's being driven out of Europe now, which is mm -hmm. awesome to see. Um, yeah, but it's funny. I remember going to Australia three times actually to speak at conferences. There was always this perception that, you know, like, oh, we got to hear from you guys because you're so advanced. And I was <laughs> talking to people. I'm like, we're you know, more advanced or ahead than you guys are. Um, we just talk about it more. I, like, I remember Ronnie saying last year as well when he came to Budapest, where he says, he was leading a round table. And he says, the difference between leading a round table in the US and one in Europe is that. He said, I just ended up listening to other people's stories because it wasn't how do I find emails in general. It was how do I like what's my reality in the country that I'm in? And is there any like what kind of thinking do I need to have to be able to contact people? And he said, well, I mean, America is all about like what tools would you use for what industry and, and things like that. But here here he says it's it's about like of course it's going to be different between Ukraine and Germany and you know UK. He says that was the big difference from him from an American point of view. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, what was interesting is uh, I won't even touch on this story, but you know, some people may be aware that when I worked with Ron Sud Sorcerer years ago, I had the opportunity to hire Balash, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he came over and we started working together. Um, he started a sourcing center in Europe. And what was what struck me as interesting is in some countries how little data there is comparatively available to source. So you have to be uh, a lot scrappier. Uh, and in fact, um, it, it's so funny because I, I invited Balash to go through one of my training sessions because I was hiring and building a sourcing center in Alfred, Georgia. And so I had this week long, like an initial training session that I was running. So he sat through that. And I remember we went to dinner several times that week and he's like, why are you talking about these techniques? And I was like, because we have a lot of data. That was a, a very funny thing. He's like, I, I don't see any purpose for some of these because I don't run into the same problem of having too much data. But too much data actually is its own challenge. Yeah. So many people over the years at conferences will say, you know, oh, it's, it's easy to find people. You know, and my stupid analogy I keep using is the haystack gets bigger. You know, the bigger the ocean, the more difficult it is to find a specific fish. So a lot of data actually causes its own challenges. And that's, again, I'm a product of my own environment, right? I started off on a database. And, you know, it's like, well, after I thought I found everybody, I'd have to figure out how do I go make a second pass and find people that my first searches didn't hit? Because I always knew there's probably other people that for some reason I'm missing. How do I go back and find them? Um, but that's a different approach. Uh, where people are saying, well, you know, there's hardly anybody in, online in my particular country or region. So I can appreciate that. But that's where I was thinking before, you know, I knew we were going to have this call. You know, I think, you know, even people like myself, you know, I like to, it's not about remaining relevant. I want to add value. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to continue adding value just going with what I'm really good at, which is core information retrieval, which if you can apply it on a data source in your country, that's fine. If it doesn't really work for you for several reasons, then that's fine too, right? Uh, some people don't have as much data. Some people don't have as many tools. You know, some people aren't using LinkedIn. Some people hate on LinkedIn. Uh, I think that's silly, but you know, it's like you go where the data is. And if you have the data, you exploit it. If you don't have the data, then you have to find some other ways to, to work around that too. But yeah, Balash, I remember he's like, why are you what is it with this technique? Explain it. And I was like, well, if you have too many results, you're going to have to refine your results. He's like, I'm lucky just to have any results. And I was like, that's a really interesting thing that I've never had to deal with having too few results. Although in, when I went to some conferences in Australia, I was, I, I tried to be smart about my presentations and ask the conference organizers, what matters to these people? You know, a lot of my background is tech, mm -hmm. uh, sourcing and recruiting. And I'm glad I asked because the conference organizers were saying, you know, 
that's not really what they're interested in. We have a lot of people that are in like the mining industry. That was big. I mean, that, that was a big thing in, in, yeah, in Australia, especially it's like, yeah. it, it's mining, it's construction, it's, you know, that's big industry. Yeah. So I made sure that all of my examples were predominantly those types of things <laughs> to make sure that, and it was funny because, and here's a funny thing, because obviously Google Plus is dying or dead now. Um, I actually found uh, like mining people, uh, also like railroad construction people on Google Plus, if you can believe it. Now, it wasn't a whole ton of them, but they were <laughs> there. Uh, so it was really kind of full, cool saying, okay, I've never had to look for mining people, but I can apply the same principles yeah. and use social media with public available things to find people on Twitter and Facebook and, and Google Plus at the time uh, that was dedicated just to the things that they cared most about. They didn't really seem to be very interested in, in IT sourcing. They're like, oh, we can handle that. That's no problem. <laughs> really, like, our time finding is, you know, mining engineers, people that have left Australia and gone to Africa. How do we find them? You know, oil and gas people that have gone to the UK. How do we get them to come back? And I was like, that's really cool. I really enjoyed thinking about those challenges, but it shows that there's still underlying processes and principles that you can apply to anything. What can uh, can people expect from you in, in Amsterdam? Like uh, for people who are who have not heard you talk before, uh, what can they, what can they expect from uh, from your keynote there? Well, in Amsterdam, I'm going to be talking about. Um, you know, I know the theme is storytelling. So I think it was late last year that Shannon and I were talking and she told me that and I said, you know, the one thing that I've never spent a lot of time talking about is referral recruiting mm -hmm. and how important it is that you just kind of teed me up. Like you have to be able to tell a story. How do you get somebody interested who's not thinking about making a change, let alone, you know, moving back to a particular country, right? But referrals, at least in my experience, I've learned that referrals are not about you. And a lot of people just go through the motions and ask people they don't realize that they actually have to tell a story first to compel someone because the reason is going to be the story and the story isn't help, helping you or helping your company. It's generally translating an opportunity into something that motivates a person to say, you know what, I, I know somebody that this will be important to them for. And it's not about the fact that Glenn asked me, right? And it's not about the name of the company in most cases. It's something that hits people on an emotional level that will make them take action and do something that you think is for you, but it's ultimately for them and the person that they're going to refer in. And I've learned in my career that storytelling is really important for that. I never really sat back and thought about that until Shannon's like storytelling, like, what can I talk about? <laughs> like, I think it's going to come down to referrals because I have a few stories of my own that I got referrals only because of my storytelling, which I didn't know I was telling a story at the time. Right. But in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, that's why it worked. I started to figure out what would be compelling enough to make somebody on their spare time for no reason whatsoever, no referral bonus, right? No incentive, take time out of their day to go talk to their network and tell people about what's going on and, and basically connect them to me. And if you think about that, I mean, you really frame it that way, that's a big challenge. That's more difficult than running a search and finding people or even the initial outreach and trying to get them to respond. Because you have somebody to go do work most people are not going to do that. So you just have to figure out. So that, that's, I'm going to talk about mostly like referrals, which uh, I'm going to also have fun. There's going to be at least one slide where I have a little bit of fun because I see a lot of writing about like OSINT, like mm -hmm. open source intelligence. And I've actually done uh, recruitment in the intelligence space uh, previously in my career. And I remember one of the things we were, I mean, there's ELINT, right? There's SIGINT, uh, but there's also human, right? Human intelligence. And I actually have a, um, a longtime friend that's in human intelligence in the military. And you know, people are talking about OSINT and they're writing articles about it, which is cool. And I'm like, okay, o OSINT's cool, but what about human, right? We're dealing with people. How do we get people to become sources of other people? It's just framing it up a little bit differently and then winding the whole storytelling element into it. Because historically, I mean, I, I've gone to a lot of conferences, but certainly haven't gone to all of them. I haven't seen too many people really try to dive into referral sourcing. Yep. And I'd like to, I mean, I know like people like to hear me talk about searching and I could talk about that forever, but I also feel, I don't want to keep talking about the same thing because I worry people are going to get bored of hearing mm -hmm. me talk about that stuff. So I'm like, what's next? Well, let's talk about people as sources and in the context of storytelling. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in Amsterdam. Glenn, if, uh, if people want to keep in contact with you and, you know, see where your new research takes you and, and whatever you come up with, how can they best do that? 
That's a great question. Um, full transparency, I am a single parent now. I don't have a lot of free time. As some people are probably aware, I haven't really written a lot in the past couple of years. And that's because I just, my life has changed and I don't have as much free time. Um, so I'm gonna put this in this segment so that I'm holding myself accountable to do these things. <laughs> so New Year's resolutions, I'm like, you know what? I don't have as much time to write as I used to. I think I might start creating some videos. I've mm -hmm. been inspired by you and several other people that create short videos. I'm like, wow, I don't have a lot of time to sit down for five to seven hours on a Sunday and write an article. I don't write quickly. It takes me a long time to produce what I write for whatever mm -hmm. reason. So it's, it's hard, but I think I could produce some quicker videos, so in less time, still share things. So probably YouTube, uh, maybe LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm also thinking about changing my, my my personal website, which is really not used for anything, not the bullying black belt, but a, a personal website where I can now, I gotta redo that and then create uh, different segments because mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm gonna to publish tomorrow uh, is about introversion and uh, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Yeah. So I think I'm going to start to diversify content. So I have areas around things like leadership or training and then like a diversity and inclusion and then sourcing will always be there. But maybe have my personal website as being like a portal to that mm -hmm. Yeah. with more video content. But I may actually leverage my network when I'm at the conference and say, hey, what's the easiest way for me to do that? You know, other people have led the way. Hopefully I can learn from others that are in the video space and have more time to create their own websites, which I don't. So. I'm looking forward to reaching out to the community and seeing if anybody can help me get to where I want to go so that I can more regularly share. But I'm going to start posting some stuff on LinkedIn just because some of it's more broad and it's not focused just on sourcing. So, All right. Sounds good. Fun. Thank you. Have fun right. and uh, see you soon. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed the show, please like the episode, subscribe to the show, and consider sharing it with anybody you think would enjoy it as well.